Now, I think the gospel reading for us this morning is very timely for our situation today. Um, if you have heard a few days ago, there was a really terrible news of a Christian Palestinian journalist by the name of Shirin Abu Akleh, shot dead while covering, while really wearing a vest and a helmet that says press. And this morning, we are awakened to another massive shooting in the United States. And, you know, we don't have to use those examples as a sign of violence. We can just go out into our neighborhood and see there's so many violence in the world today. And that is why I think the text that is given for us this morning is so timely and most difficult to follow and obey. And so let me read it for you. It's taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, and just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Let's pray. Spirit of God, we believe that you enabled John the Apostle to remember these words from the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray and give thanks and gather all the time, and write them for us as your written word. By the same Spirit, will you allow us to enter into the reality that these words are speaking so that we can follow his command, that we love one another, and therefore people will know that we are his disciples. In his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Now, I have to say that this is one of my favorites in the whole Bible. Um, if you have attended a wedding that I officiate, part of it will be using this text, because in it we find the essence of the gospel of Jesus and how the gospel is to be lived out by his followers. But at the same time, it is a text that I often fail to obey and live out. And I wouldn't you know, be uh, surprised if it's a text that you often fail to obey and live out as well. It's a difficult text to obey and follow. But Jesus could not be any more clearer. It is not by our theological position or doctrinal correctness that everyone will know that we are his disciples. It is not by our moral purity that everyone will know that we are his disciples. It's not even by our impressive knowledge that everyone will know that we are his disciples. It's quite simply by our love. And let me be clear by saying what our love means. It does not mean like some would define it as love the sinner, hate the sin. We've probably heard that before, right? Love the sinner, hate the sin. Okay, why? Why can it define, be defined that way? For simple reason that you can't have the word love and hate in the same sentence and expect it to work. Love the sinner, hate the sin does not work, and we'll see why in a moment. And when I say by our love, it simply means by our loving acts, by our loving acts of service and sacrifice, acts that point to the love of God for the world made known in Jesus Christ. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love, for one another. Now, we see this hinted in the story of Tabitha or Dorcas that we read last week in Acts chapter 9, verses 36. We read, now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was well versed in her theological position or doctrinal convictions, right? Is that what it says? No. <laughs> 
What does it say? It says, now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. As is the case with many of the lectionary texts, something is lost when the passage is not read in its literary context. I've said this before, a text without a context is a pretext for a con. If we read a text without its context, we can get con, and we don't want to get con. And so it is important to see the context of this text. And the context of this text is, of course, John's account of Jesus' Last Supper with his disciples. In this account, we hear about many things that Jesus knows. And we hear about how he responds to the knowledge that he has. Okay, what does he know? He knows that his hour has come to depart from this world and go to his Father. John 13, verse 1, the, 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 the earlier part. And then how does he respond to this knowledge? It says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What else does he know? He knows that the Father has given all things into his hands and that he has come from God and is going to God. John 13, verse 3. And how does he respond? Verse 4, he gets up from the table and takes up the role of a slave, washing his disciples' dusty and dirty and probably stinky feet. And there's one more thing that he knows. Jesus also knows who is about to betray him. And he is very troubled by this knowledge. Yet how does he respond? He announces the imminent betrayal to his disciples and then proceeds to feed the betrayer. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. Judas then leaves to do his dirty work, and the narrator adds, and it was night. It was dark. And it's at dark, that dark moment that our text began when he, when Judas, had gone out and Jesus said. Now, we might expect a speech about how evil Judas is, right? That's what you can probably expect from me if that happened to me. And how awful the consequences of his actions will be for him. But instead, Jesus focuses on his mission and focuses on preparing his disciples for of what is to come. He speaks of being glorified and glorifying God, which in John language is a reference for him to be crucified, to be elevated to the cross. And then he tells the disciples in tender words, little children, that he will be with them only a little longer. And that where he is going, they cannot go. And then this conversation, of course, continues after our text with Peter asking, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus responding, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter responds, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. To which Jesus responds by predicting Peter's denial of him. Yes, Jesus also knows that Peter, one of his closest companions, will deny him. Yet his parting words to his disciples focus not on blame for their past or future failures, but instead on preparing them for what is to come, promising that although he will no longer be physically present with them, they will not be abandoned. He will not abandon them. And in the coming chapters, Jesus will talk about the paraclete, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, who will teach and advise and comfort them. But for now, our text, he focuses on the need for his disciples to live in community, to love one another as he has loved them. And so he gave them a new command. And this new command that you love one another as I have loved you is actually in parallel with what Jesus has already said to his disciples. Earlier, in verses 13 to 15, he said, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. 
And so if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. And then the new commandment is also paralleled in John 15, verses 12 to 14. This is my commandment, he said, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. So these two parallels sandwich our text, if you will, and close our text and help us to flesh out the meaning of loving one another. And it goes on like this. On the one hand, loving one another as Jesus has loved encompasses the very mundane. It simply means serving one another, even in the most menial task. But on the other hand, this love also encompasses heroic acts of great risk. It extends even to the point of giving one's life for another. And we see this in Jesus himself. The love of which Jesus speaks then and which Jesus demonstrates in his life and death is a love which extends from the mundane to the heroic and everything in between. This is why love the sinner, hate the sin, as I said earlier, does not work. Because every kind of love that Jesus demonstrates, the heroic and the mundane, are all self-giving acts. Self-giving acts of love. And when we introduce the word hate alongside love, we immediately are prevented to act in self-giving way. Love and hate does not work in one sentence. Jesus tells his disciples that it is by the kind of love that extends from the mundane to the heroic and encompass every kind of self-giving act in between that everyone will know that they are his disciples. Now, some people have said that John's gospel focuses on mutual love between the community the community of disciples. And therefore, it doesn't speak of love for those on the outside, love for the others, or love for the enemies. And I think that's a misreading of the Gospel of John. Because while it is true that Jesus commands his disciples to love one another, nevertheless, he also declares God's love for the world. For God so loved the world, it says. And this declaration surely includes those outside the community of faith. And Jesus demonstrates the depth of God's love for the world that is hostile to God in his death on the cross. In chapter 13, Jesus demonstrates his love for the same disciples who will fail him miserably. Jesus washes his, the disciples' feet and feeds Judas who will betray him, Peter who will deny him, and all the rest who will, who will fail to stand by him in his greatest hour of distress. The love that Jesus demonstrates is certainly not based on the merit of the recipients. And Jesus commands his disciples to love others in the same way. But we, his disciples, have continuously fallen far short in our love for one another. Can I see a raise of hands? Yes, I see that hand. You can put it down. Yes, I see that hand. Can I go around again? Just kidding. <laughs> My hand would be kept up because I fail. As well as our love for those outside the community of faith. Theological, doctrinal, and ethical arguments often descend into personal attacks, right? And name calling. Personal interests often trump the common good of the community. Those who are in need of compassion find judgment instead. And Jesus could not be any clearer. It is not by our theological position that we are known as his disciples. It is not by our doctrinal correctness that everyone will know that we are his disciples. It is not by our moral purity that everyone will know that we are his disciples. 
It's definitely not because of our impressive knowledge that everyone will know that we are his disciples. It's quite simply by our loving acts demonstrated in acts of service, of sacrifice, acts that point to the love of God for the world made known in Jesus Christ. Loving those with whom we agree or partial to is the easy part. Loving the rest of the folks we come in contact with is much harder. But you know that this is not news for you. It is a part of the human condition to love and to want to be loved. But the reality is it is easier to love those who are more loving and lovable. You know, it is said that John in his old age, that's why the text is connected to the Revelation text, in his old age would remind his disciples to love one another. And when he, question, when he was questioned why, he told them this very often. He would reply this, because it is what our Lord commanded. If it is all that you do, then it is enough. If all that you do is love, it is enough. And that is precisely what we see in the story of Peter in our Acts reading. He said it was the Spirit who told him to go with uncircumcised men. That's theology. That's doctrine. And not to make a distinction between them. That's love. When we love one another, no matter who they are, we are fully living into the love we are commanded to show to one another by Jesus. When we love one another, we are living in the future reality when God is with us, when the home of God is among mortals, as the Revelation text tells us. He will dwell with them as their God, as our reading says. And this commandment is what will ensure Jesus' presence among us and continue his work of making all things new. Love one another. The space Jesus once physically occupied amongst his disciples is now to be filled with their love, our love for one another. You see, there is something about our love for one another that is iconic, revelatory, and makes Christ present in whatever circumstances we might find ourselves. Jesus' command to love one another is both our preparation for and our participation in his resurrection life here and now. Love reveals the new heaven and the new earth. Love is the gateway, the entry into the new Jerusalem. Love makes all things new. Love is both the means and the goal, a journey that has no ending and a destination that has no fixed point. To love Jesus' commands is independent of the other who is, the, independent of the other, the, independent of who the other is and our feelings about him or her or them. It is not determined by our assessment of his or her or their qualities or lovability. It takes us beyond sentimentality, emotions, and familial kinship. It is less about a feeling and more about a choice. If we are his disciples, if we are Jesus' disciples, we show it by choosing to love one another. And again, the mark of Christ's disciples is not theological convictions that they believe. It's not doctrinal positions that they hold on to, but how they love. Friends, love is the commitment, the attachment, and loyalty to another that is embodied and enacted in concrete ways. You see, we do not believe or reason our way into loving one another. We act our way into loving one another. And that's what Jesus did. His life, his death, his resurrection are nothing less than the embodiment and enactment of love. You and I, his disciples, continue that through our love for one another. And it's all pretty simple when you get right down to it, actually. It's all about people. It is never an abstract idea. It's always about people. It's about life. 
It's about circumstances. It is about seeing that the home of God is among mortals. It looks like people running to help the injured person. It's a bedside vigil when all you can do is hold a hand. It's standing next to another and listening to his or her diagnosis of a major illness. It's cooking or delivering a meal to one whose appetite has been stolen by sorrow. It's the courage to sit with the pain and loss of another person, knowing that you have no idea what to say or do. It is the giving of our resources and money to care for another whom we have never met or will never meet. It is a silent night of tears and prayers. These and a thousand other acts like them are the acts of love that have been done for us and, by God's grace, we do for another. And when we see these things happening, we see what a new heaven and a new earth look like. And we know ourselves to be the living people, the living community living in the new Jerusalem. And when we hear stories about these acts of love, we are actually experiencing all things being made new. Let's pray. Spirit of God, help us. For you are known to be the spirit of love. Help us to live in the new Jerusalem even now. Help us to live participating in the work of our Lord, making all things new. Help us to take the form of a slave like our Lord and love one another and love the other without any agendas, without any desire to be affirmed or to be returned. Help us to just love like Jesus loved. And by this, the world will see that we are indeed Jesus' disciples. For the glory and praise of his name we pray. Amen.